Imagine yourself as a theropod dinosaur, roaming around North America in the late Cretaceous period. You're hungry, and you're looking for the next unlucky, possibly herbivorous dinosaur you can use as your next meal. You look around the area for a bit, and you see it. A lone Parasaurolophus feeding on some vegetation, completely unaware of your presence. You sneak up a little before you make your move. You wait a bit. And then, you run for it, completely establishing your presence to the para. You get closer and closer to it, but something's wrong. The para's not running. In fact, it seems to be standing its ground. But whatever, that doesn't deter you. You go in for the kill, and then all of a sudden, the para opens its mouth. But it doesn't let out a roar. Instead, the only thing you see is a massive inferno emerging from its mouth, and all you feel is the painful burning overcoming your face. It is then that you realize you just got roasted. Nothing like starting a video off with a dead meme. I'm glad this is my first video back after reaching 10,000 subscribers, which thank you all by the way. This is a number I never thought I'd reach and it feels pretty good that my content is getting this kind of attention. Especially today's video, which is about the fire-breathing Parasaurolophus theory. Now you're probably wondering, Diego, what in the everlasting hell are you talking about? Don't worry, I'll explain everything, but we have to start at the beginning. So my fascination with this theory all started with this picture right here. And in case you didn't know, this is all that it really takes to completely encapsulate me. No joke, if an image like this pops up in my feed on any platform, I will drop everything I'm doing just to look more into it, because I simply need to know more. What's the context here? Who came up with it? Why does it feel like one of those things in which I'm supposed to take seriously but I find unironically funny? So I did some digging. The fire-breathing Parasaurolophus theory seemed to have first shown up in a book known as Dinosaurs by Design, which is a title that has become somewhat infamous in the paleontology world. As this book was written by a creationist scientist, so you know we're dealing with a professional here, the creationist scientist in question is known as Dwayne Gish. And just from doing a little bit of research on the guy, it didn't take me too long to realize that he himself himself is also somewhat infamous in the paleontology world. We'll get to his story in due time, but to give you a taste of his ideas, all you really need to do is take a look at his book, Dinosaurs by Design, which surprisingly, I was actually able to get a copy of. Usually when it comes to these kinds of videos, it's hard for me to get my hands on these kinds of works, mainly because they're just old and outdated, and as a result, they've become pretty rare. So any copy I do end up finding being sold on the internet, they usually go for an ungodly amount of money that I'm just not willing to spend. But to my surprise, despite being released in 1992, Dinosaurs by Design was actually really easy to obtain. Not only was it really cheap on a trustworthy site that I typically order things from, I was able to get it within a couple of days of ordering it. And I really didn't know what I was getting myself into, as I've never really read any works in terms of dinosaurs and or paleontology from the perspective of a creationist scientist. So when going into this book, I was half expecting some crazy and ridiculous ideas completely filled each page that I read. But that wasn't the case here. In fact, Dinosaurs by Design for the most part is structured like any normal dinosaur book, with the exception of the categories within this read that incorporate the ideas of the Bible with that of paleontology. And keep in mind, when I say that, I don't mean it out of hate. Quite the contrary, actually. I found this book to be really interesting, being able to see how dinosaurs are perceived from a different perspective. Each page had a good amount of accurate information on the dinosaurs that were being talked about, along with the process of fossilization, works in paleontology, and so on. But then we get to the sections that talk about certain ideas in regards to dinosaurs that are perceived based on what is said in the Bible. And that's where the fire-breathing Parasaurolophus theory comes in. Near the end of the book, there is a section in which Gish mentions how God had given certain animals unique and specialized methods of defense against their enemies that don't include claws or teeth. In this section, he mentions a Bible verse that reads, His sneezings flash forth light, and his eyes are like eyelids of the morning. Out of his mouth go burning lights, sparks of fire shoot out, smoke goes out of his nostrils as from a boiling pot, and burning rushes. Now, for context, earlier in the book, it was mentioned that the Bible had made several references to dragons, and this verse is most likely just another reference to that. It talks about burning lights and sparks of fire and smoke. It's kind of hard to not see this as a reference to dragons. 
Yet this description would contribute to a theory that Gish had about the Parasaurolophus and the purpose of its crest. Prior to this point, there had been many theories as to what the Parasaurolophus's crest could have been used for. Some suggested that it could have been used as a snorkel to help it breathe as it dunked its head to reach for vegetation in shallow waters. Others suggested it was possibly used as a storage space for a salt gland. A lot of these theories didn't really hold up, but about a decade before this book was published, another theory was suggested that was more plausible than the ones that were just mentioned. And that was the fact that the hollow crests could have been used to produce sounds and loud calls that would have been useful for the hadrosaur in certain situations. Despite the reasonable speculation, it didn't stop Gish from making his own theory around the crest that comes from the Bible verse that was mentioned earlier. And that was the fact that maybe the Parasaurolophus had chemicals within the hollow chambers of its crest that would mix into an incendiary product that would spontaneously combust into flames the moment it made contact with the oxygen in the air. All while being sprayed at whatever is attacking the para since it's meant to be used as some sort of defense mechanism. Now obviously while the concept of it sounds really cool, the overall theory that this may have been an actual possibility is a bit ridiculous. But Gish goes on to explain his reasoning behind this theory by comparing the science behind the fire-breathing Parasaurolophus with that of the Bombardier Beetle that uses a similar tactic. Bombardier beetles, which I apologize if I'm saying that incorrectly, are ground beetles that are most well known for their unique defense mechanism of being able to shower their enemies with a hot chemical spray whose contents come from two separate glands stored within its abdomen. The contents from the first gland include hydrogen peroxide and hydroquinone, and the second includes catalasis and peroxidasis enzymes. It is only when the sets of chemicals and the sets of enzymes are mixed that they form an irritant hot chemical known as quinone, which is what gets sprayed out from the tip of the beetle's abdomen towards the enemy it's trying to ward off. A very interesting defense mechanism, but it seems unlikely that a Parasaurolophus would have it, or at least something close to it. And this wasn't the only weird, inaccurate thing this book contained. It had other different ideas that were just completely absurd. For example, the idea that man walked alongside the dinosaurs, or the possibilities that dinosaurs are still around today. It's things like this that would garner this book a certain reputation, one that's not taken too seriously amongst those who were more into believing the concept of evolution. And it didn't help that Dwayne Gish himself didn't have the best reputation either in this field, as not only was Dinosaurs by Design just one of his many works in creation science, but he himself is, to put it simply, kind of irritating, especially when it came to debates. Like I said earlier, Dwayne Gish is pretty infamous when it comes to certain fields of science, with a major factor of that having to do with how he would act during debates. Gish has been criticized and accused of doing things like failing to answer opponents' questions, being hypocritical, using standardized presentations, and even presenting false information. Gish would also use a rapid-fire method of presenting topics and then changing said topics quickly shortly after, which would become so attached to his name that the official name for this method is called the Gish Gallop. The whole point of the Gish Gallop is to overwhelm your opponent with several topics you're trying to argue and switch them at a pace that's impossible to keep up up with, with little care for the legitimacy or accuracy of the points that are being rapid fired. The Gish Gallop also resembles another debate method that's known as spreading, which from what I can gather is a controversial method, and the consensus on whether it is a fair practice to use during debates seem to be up in the air. Some think it's an unfair strategy, but others seem to be okay with it being used during debates. And it seems that, just like spreading, the Gish Gallop is a method that's sometimes used. Maybe not commonly, but it doesn't seem to be completely unknown. I think it's just really interesting to see that this is one of the several things that Gish left behind as his legacy. Anyway, stepping away from that, Gish's book, Dinosaurs by Design, from what I can gather, didn't leave the best impression on some people, but did with others. Unfortunately, I wasn't really able to find much in regards to the book's overall reception for its original release back in 1992. But based on the reviews that are left from various sites selling the book now, the ratings for it are higher than I originally thought that they were going to be. I know that these reviews don't necessarily make up the overall reception of the book, but it's still worth noting since these reviews are coming from the people themselves. And and just from what I've gathered from these reviews, it seems that people praise this book mainly for having a biblical perspective on prehistoric life. 
Personally, I can't really blame them, as I also think the premise is pretty interesting, but that doesn't mean I really believe any of it. And as far as the lower ratings for the book goes, a portion of it are from people that seem to disagree with Gish's standpoint on certain aspects of the book and find it completely absurd. And speaking of absurdity, as far as the absurd theory behind the fire-breathing dinosaur goes, how did people react to it? While I can't find much on how people originally reacted to the theory when the book was first released, many sources I found don't seem to take it too seriously. There was even a book written very recently about the overall ideas that creationists have had in regards to dinosaurs over the years called Fire Breathing Dinosaurs, The Hilarious History of Creationist Pseudoscientists at Its Silliest. And the front cover of the book features a Parasaurolophus, with smoke coming out of its nostrils indicating its fire breathing abilities. The book was written by Philip J. Center, and the book is supposed to serve as a documentation of beliefs that creationist scientists have had in regards to dinosaurs that have occurred within the last decade. It was here where I found out that Gish didn't just suggest fire breathing for just the Parasaurolophus, but apparently he thought other dinosaurs were able to do this as well. And when I looked into this, I found out that the idea that creationist authors interpreting mythological creatures as dinosaurs actually has a name to it. This is what it's called here. I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. I know I'm going to butcher it, so yeah, I'm not even going to try. And in the beginning of the video, I mentioned that the fire-breathing Parasaurolophus theory was first seen in Gish's book. But the overall idea of fire-breathing dinosaurs could have possibly gone back even farther. And it seems that Gish had inspired others with this theory, as other people within the last decade have come up with their own ideas and visions of fire-breathing dinosaurs slash prehistoric creatures and how the Bible relates to that ability. And while most of them usually use hadrosaurs as an example of this ability, other creatures are used as well, like pterosaurs and prehistoric crocodiles. In an article talking about this book, it mentions that some people believe in fire-breathing sarcosuchuses. And looking into this, I found a blog called Christian Ryan, where the author compares the Leviathan, a biblical monster that is semi-aquatic, has scales, was a large beast with sharp teeth, and could breathe out fire, to a sarcosuchus, which was also semi-aquatic, had scales, was a large beast with sharp teeth, and was speculated to breathe fire in this very blog. Basically, the same theory that Gish made for the fire-breathing Parasaurolophus in Dinosaurs by Design was used here as well, with the comparison being made with the Bombardier Beetle, except instead of the chemicals being stored within a crest, it's implied that it's stored within the Sarcosuchus's bulla, which is the noticeably larger region at the end of its snout. Now, I could probably list more examples if I looked into it enough, but I don't really feel like making another hour-long video. This specific theory seemed to be one of the more popular ones amongst creationist scientists, but it's also one that Center gave his own thoughts on in his book, and his thoughts on the matter boiled down to the fact that this is a nonsensical theory, and argued against them by showing how it anatomically doesn't make sense for a dinosaur to have an ability like fire breathing, and even shows how it can severely affect the dinosaur if it did. If certain chemicals were mixed, they could potentially cause an explosion, which would do more damage to the hadrosaur than what it was trying to defend itself from. So overall, according to many sources, the conclusion is, it simply would not make sense for any of these prehistoric animals to have any sort of fire breathing ability. Abilities. So do creationists take this into account? Well, some do, but others are pretty set in their ways and beliefs. Sometimes you can't always get through to everyone, but it's nice to see that some people are willing to look past the surface and their own beliefs and ways just to see if there are other possibilities. And I will say, despite the absurdities and the inaccuracies, the theory itself is very interesting, and I guess in most contexts, extremely hilarious. And the idea of a fire-breathing dinosaur does sound pretty cool. I can't deny that.